Hello and welcome to The Smartest Moron, where today we're talking about a game that a lot of people really, really like, but unfortunately I absolutely hate. Though, really, compared to the third birthday, this is more of a flick to the forehead as opposed to someone punching me in the crotch. But before we get into the game, a little backstory. The developers were Mistwalker, headed by the creator of Final Fantasy, Hironobu Sakaguchi. And before this game, they were responsible for the OK RPG Blue Dragon and the not so well received yet awesome Lost Odyssey. I swear to God, I will cover those. Hopefully. This wasn't the first action RPG they did, as Blue Dragon Awakened Shadow was made before the last story. Awakened Shadow was a pile of crap with a worse plot, so these devs are about 50 50. There are rumors of a new game being made by them, and I pray it's Lost Odyssey 2 and not. The Last Story 2. Because of the criticisms of turn-based combat, Sakaguchi thought old trends weren't doing so well with this generation, and thus came up with this game. While more used to working on Xbox 360 exclusives, Nintendo seemed to share Sakaguchi's vision. He and Takuya Matsumoto were the ones to work on the story as well, and apparently many other staff members. Now keep in mind, I'm taking all these sources from Wikipedia, but apparently Sakaguchi hated people nitpicking the story, like out-of-character behavior. Why do I have a feeling this isn't exactly exclusive to Sakaguchi? Joking aside, kinda sorta, the script had to be redone, switching from science fiction to a bit more medieval, much like other fantasy games. They apparently took inspiration from Uncharted by having dialogue take place during action. We'll see how poorly that went later. It's amazing this game even left the state it was in, as it took nine years before it hit Japan. And given the change of themes from romance to companionship, the story was bound to change even more. And into more of a mess. But hell, it seemed like we weren't even going to get this game, with Nintendo explaining the extra work would interfere with the other games. But Europe was getting them anyway due to the market there, which explains a lot of interesting voice talent that isn't just Yuri Lowenthal taking every damn role. Note, I do not hate Yuri Lowenthal. Haseo is awesome. Yet thanks to Operation Rainfall, a fan-based movement that is now a community, we not only got the last story, but we also got Xenoblade Chronicles and Pandora's Tower. If you want my opinion on game superiority, well, I think Xenoblade is amazing. Pandora's Tower is pretty okay so far. I dropped it for a while, but I need to pick it back up. And the last story being one of the worst experiences I have ever endured, both in terms of gameplay and narrative. But enough of the side story crap or whatever, let's dive into the last story. And in case you're wondering, I don't have a physical copy again. You know, because I rented it from Gamefly when they offered me a free week or so. And, well, it was either this or Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, and oh my god, I just realized a big mistake I made there. What the hell was I thinking? You're always late, you. Help us, you idiot. Who's an idiot? I hope you aren't pulling one of us idiots. Right, Zay? Never get time. The game is a third-person action RPG, though there are some things to note. For instance, all attacks are done automatically when you get closer to the enemy. Zale, the hero you control, lacks magic, but he does eventually learn some skills to help do more than just walk up to the enemy and hit them repeatedly. You can turn off the auto attack, but for some odd reason, this reduces your attack power. I have no idea why. As such, swordplay never really became a joy to look at. If anything, it mostly looked like someone flailing a weapon around. For a club, I can kinda understand, but these are characters using swords and sometimes even scythes and other weapons. You don't wield this crap like this unless you want to drain your stamina really damn fast or open yourself to major hits. Fortunately, there are other moves you can do, such as do a dash attack to dispel magic circles, but more on those later. The game can also turn into a third-person shooter with Zale's crossbow. While the reticule is way bigger than it should be, actually interfering with my sights in a battle, it does at least open the option of long-range combat, which felt a bit more satisfying. There are a wide variety of arrows to choose from, each with different effects and ways to kill an enemy. My favorite was the banana peel, as it works for more than just pranking people. <laughs> Hilarious. The camera is a real issue in some places, not help with the extremely cramped areas, making dodging almost worthless since you are gonna get hit anyway. At least blocking is an option, and needed to stop auto-swinging everything near you. But now back to those circles. They give bonus effects depending on which one is used, such as curing ailments or healing health over time, to adding elemental attacks. You can also dispel them for instant buffs or debuffs against the enemy, and it's sometimes needed not just for enemy strength, but also when enemies heal from their own circles. Though some levels are cheap enough to have a the floor is lava effect to quickly kill you. It was a nice idea on paper, especially when you cannot use items like potions in a fight, but poorly executed when the magic effects actually make it harder to see what is going on. 
This makes auto attacking just worthless or aiming your damn crossbow. In a better game, this might have worked, but those circles are meant to be helping you too, as some enemies have elemental weaknesses that must be exploited, so you can't just dispel each and every one of them. Combat isn't exactly hard despite my complaints, though. It's merely just frustrating with limited movements at times, your sight being robbed from you, and any grinding need to be done at an arena or at these red circles and dungeons. You level up so frequently in this game that it just, it's not even fun. Just go into a fight and keep fighting until the experience you gain is complete crap. For a game that prioritizes the strategy, I barely did any of it and still came out on top. This is also added with characters having lives and can die up to 5 before getting knocked out for good in that one fight. And since HP heals afterwards, there's no real worries outside of fights. Mostly anyway. Some enemies do take out your HP in one hit. Exploration is also pretty damn slim. You can go into previous dungeons for extra items, yet no extra experience points because this game hates me. There is no real set loot either at times, meaning you can get pretty random stuff even in the main dungeons. It's a bit confusing, but let me explain. You can gain a random set of money or a random set of materials. The funny thing is, you can figure out where certain type of loot is, you can actually restart the stage to keep getting that type of loot. There's only one town in the game, but it is certainly big enough for some exploration. And there is a mechanic where you can find random stuff in the wind for weapon and armor upgrades, if you are good enough. Though it's really pointless. I'll give credit that the town certainly feels alive at times, but I cannot remember any character names or significant events. The game can also be a bit buggy at times, so there was at least one part that forced me to reload the game to finish it. Alright! Alright! I'm sorry! Okay? Alright, taking a breather from the negatives, let's focus on some positives because this game isn't that bad. While there are hardly if any pre-rendered cutscenes, this was done to make events like this happen, where you suddenly go into first person. This is not only done to figure out plot elements for calmer moments, but it does make things a bit more intense, as sometimes you can find an enemy and dodge an ambush, or dodge being impaled. Failing these does have penalties, as you can end up with lower health or even a life taken away. If there's one moment where the game ever got my attention, it was during these moments. They are even a step above quick time events, as you have to actively search for stuff. It's really damn good. There is some strategy with targeting at least as well. You gain the ability to have all enemies, or at least most in some cases, to lock onto you. While this can sound like a nightmare situation, it can give your allies enough breathing room to attack from behind and deal more damage. At least if they are smart enough. Your power can also increase as the story goes on, allowing you to slow enemies down after they deal enough damage to you. Another neat idea is how much you can upgrade your armor. Physical changes are applied, and you can actually reduce these changes and change the color of your outfits into something more your style. The only real downside is not knowing what's a better suit for your party members until you keep upgrading. I just tended to go with what I like best, and with some help from the nerdy novice, we created a new show. Fashion, bitches! Oh yeah, turn for me, right there. I think that color will do you fine. You all look beautiful, darlings. Oh yes, way better than that lightning lady, though we did at least save on Botox. Unfortunately, this also brings me to one of my biggest gripes of the game. Dragon armor. The most powerful armor in the game, or at least the most unique. Now, I love these kind of outfits, and sadly nowadays, these are mostly DLC exclusives. So when I heard about having a suit of armor made from some freaking dragon scales, and in a game that hardly showed any dragons, I was still excited as hell. Just what could this possibly? Sweet merciful crap, what the hell is that? This is hands down one of the ugliest armors I've ever seen. Even when fully upgraded, and the option to remove bits and pieces, I couldn't make it work for my eyes! For a reward that can be easily obtained through repeating stages for no experience, I felt so let down! I don't even think the fashion designer can make this work! Oh darling, now let's see. Oh, no, 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 honey. Oh, you look like Godzilla pooped you out and then had sex with the Rockbiter. And I mean the third movie, Rockbiter. Good lord, man! And while the game does have online multiplayer, I'm pretty sure Wii servers are down right now, so it's pretty pointless. Still, I think now's as good a time as any to get right down to the plot. Your name is Zed. Hear me in the this. The outsider's power will eventually be mine. I suggest you steal yourself for what lies ahead. The story is pretty simple on the surface, and in general. A group of heroes are a band of mercenaries, investigating some ruins. And Sarin nearly gets killed. Zeal suffers from traumatic events, reminded of his mother when she was killed by bandits, and everything was on fire. You know, some of this kind of sounds familiar. <laughs> hmm. 
Much as I fell out of love with Sephiroth, I do admit he'd make for a more entertaining villain than what we have later. But Zeal does eventually gain power he can call upon on his hand. That power is to be a glowing target for enemies. Yay. But seriously, I actually like this ability given to Zeal since it kinda reflects his attitude. At least in some parts of the game and his desire to help people. Through some more adventuring and fighting all sorts of weird foes that really have no significant impact until later on, the game eventually introduces Callista, who the gang isn't exactly aware she's a princess until later. The game's pacing is a slow one, but here's the important things you need to know so I don't drag this out because I don't have enough material for jokes. Callista and Zeal are the main heroes, and Zeal's group of mercenaries is eventually put to work when the Count recognizes Zeal's abilities. Together, they must face off against not only monsters like the Reptids, but also the Garak who, well, want to kill them as well. Sad thing is, I can't even describe everything to get to that plot point, because it takes roughly a third to finally get through. The rest is trying to tolerate Jarol's annoying ass attitude, or fighting the Garak to learn more about the powers of the Outsider, the power Zale has. Despite the linear nature of the story and game, you don't have to follow each and every single chapter. Some events can be skipped entirely. If anything, it's encouraged that you seek out other characters in the area to do more character-focused chapters. Some boss fights, though, are repeated both here and the main story, though. There are more conflicts, however, as the game likes to show the theme of companionship versus duty. With Zale's group is constantly criticized and insulted, Dagrin tries to make them knights to gain that respect. Really though, Zale's the only one who gives a crap about that. The game tries to show how everything is in black and white with that ideal, with how knights and everything Zale once contrasts with his overall views. What could have been a great angle, and to an extent it actually does work, is turned into tedium and boring scenes as the game simply just focuses so much on Zale. And while there are a couple of good scenes here and there, there are very few in number, and only about one of the other characters get any type of resolution. Another example of how the plot tells more than it shows is the banter in some battles. Now for some fights, this can work out great, like dialogue between Zale and Aster. Plus, I always got how these guys were friends, minus the fact that it's hard to hear them half the damn time due to the frickin' sound effects. However, fights where the characters talk about funny stories kind of fails a bit. Now, this can work if they are talking about funny events that had happened when they weren't there for it, maybe pestering other characters or making bets or commenting on the situation, what doesn't work is when you describe a funny scene that doesn't freaking happen. Miranda, for example, supposedly likes to eat a lot. Yet we never see it, and there are plenty of opportunities to do it. Yet in something like, say, Dragon Ball, seeing Goku eat a ton and ask for seconds works because we not only see how much he can put away, but also see the reaction of everyone else, and the suffering of Master Roshi losing all of his money. It doesn't really work as well here, though. Not helping things is that the plot is painfully predictable in a lot of areas, especially with the obvious villains, like the Count himself. Seriously, he has an eye patch, wears all black, and even laughs in an evil manner while also being a one-note asshole. And then there's Zangarak, King of the Garak, and really another one-note bad guy. Really, only the spoiler villain had any kind of depth to him. It's not usually a bad thing, as so long as they can be interesting or offer a good reason for their evil actions, or be freaking badass. But it just makes the characters boring as sin here. Or in Jarl's case, just freaking pointless and annoying. Although the more I look at Zangarak, he kind of looks familiar. Almost like... Hey, wait a minute. Okay, um, I think I just realized something. We have a villain who looks suspiciously like Ganondorf with evil magic, evil minions, all that crap. We have a princess who wants to save her kingdom no matter what. Granted, I think Zelda here is much better than Callista. And we have a hero with a magic symbol on his hand, wields swords, and just wants to protect stuff and all that crap. This is a freaking Zelda game! I can't believe I never saw this before. It took the help of a friend to make me see all of this and... Honestly, it's kind of shocking and hilarious, and sad because even Hyrule Warriors' plot was better than this drivel. But let me say this before we go into the spoilers. My problem is not that this game is predictable. I can predict some plot elements and stories due to my experience, and I don't have a problem so long as it is done well, like the Hibija route in Senran Kagar when some things were obvious, and some things weren't. This game unfortunately doesn't do much of that well here. So rather than focus on more interesting elements like the other characters, it pays more attention to the very people dragging the plot down. That is where I take issue with it. So let's dive into those spoilers now to figure out what the hell is wrong. Now this island will become the most powerful fortress in the world. The Empire, no. The whole world will be mine. <laughs> For here, we'll focus on the themes and some of the main leads. So we kind of know how the game handles companionship, but let's focus a bit more on duty before diving into Zale as a whole. Now, the Code of Knights tends to vary a bit in some media, so I couldn't just rely on one form for this. But a common thing I notice is their overall loyalty. 
and how their lord can influence their behavior. We see that in how most knights on Lazulus are lazy, greedy, and overall incompetent. They care only about themselves just like the obvious bad guy, the Count. That is not what I take issue with, and that's what General Astar and Therius come in, as they're meant to be more of role models to Zael, and they are knights from elsewhere. But aside from these two, we see no evidence of noble behavior from knights in general. We don't even see a knight save Zael during that flashback of the trauma, and we already know Dagrin took him in as a partner, and that guy already has a hatred of knights due to what happened to him. Now, the problem here is that Zael isn't really choosing duty a lot of the time, or if it is, it's not really explored all that well. For instance, during a moment when Zael is too shocked at the knights killing and enslaving the citizens of their enemies, including children and their mothers, and if you wanted another reason to hate this moron, there it is. Good freaking god, you're making me pine for snow, Villiers. What is wrong with you? And while he doesn't outright attack and slaughter the knights to, well, pretty much betray the Count and get him cast in jail again, he mainly does this for the sake of Callista, his love interest. Now, Surin brings up how they saw this type of stuff before, which just raises a ton of questions. Like, was it the exact same situation? Was it just slaughter? Why not rise against them? This thing could have been fixed quite easily too, like Zael nearly attacking the knights, but held back and told just how dangerous that is, not only to those enslaved, but to himself and his entire team. At the very least, show me his mental process aside from, well, trauma. Hell, we see him ready to beat down Jeral for insulting his dead mentor before being stopped, and that scene was one of the few fine and understandable ones. You know, aside from Jeral. This scene pretty much played for laughs layered by a generic evil knight with a pompous laugh. But this again reflects another problem, the love story. Why? Because the same issue is resolved back at the castle with Zael trying to run away with Callista, absolutely ignoring the whole slavery thing. Though to be fair, they think destroying the Lazulus cannon will end everything, despite oh so many other factors no one accounts for. Let's name them, shall we? The remaining knights in the castle, remaining normal guards around the city, the other Garak soldiers and their king who will no doubt attack the city, the wild monsters like Reptids no doubt outside the city, and inside as we saw in the quests, and most importantly, the frigging city has turned into a frigging island! Meaning there is hardly any chance of escape! They just think no more cannon means no more conflict. Yes, it is destroying the land, but the Gorak are determined to make sure there's no one left alive except themselves. So what do they do after they try to destroy the cannon? Easy, they try to use the cannon, of course, from the help of the obviously evil bad guy. Uh, I don't think the nitpickers were doing a good enough job, honestly. And more importantly, this keeps bringing things back to doing it all for the sake of romance. Hell, Zale nearly damned his friends to death just to make sure Callista's life wasn't harmed slightly more when the group was put on trial... ...without their consent. He was willing to save a woman he barely knew at the cost of his friends. Everything is about Zale's choice, how Zale develops from this, what Zale's thoughts are unless a quest is specifically tailored to another character. Plus the game constantly wants to force these two together so much it freaking hurts! Not only that, but Callista seems to rarely offer any kind of help or good development on her own. I mean, she gave me sleeping arrows once, that were eventually rendered useless and unattainable after Zael stupidly forgot them. The only reason she is not as horrible as Beatrice from Dante's Inferno is because Callista at least finally stands up for herself in the game, sick of the bullcrap the Count constantly puts her through. Though a bit far too freaking late. Also, she didn't make a deal with a demonic force despite being one of the good people. And I know what some may be thinking. Well, she was certainly put down by her uncle a lot and had to obey him. That might have been a good excuse if she didn't constantly flee the goddamn castle and constantly endanger those around her, even if she did warn them of the consequences. For God's sakes, lady, show some damn anger. If you're strong enough to one-hit kill enemies with your magic, you should at least be able to make Jeral your bitch, not be his little doll to be slapped around constantly. And even if you are acting like this, who the hell are you defending? I could at least buy that excuse, but... There's absolutely no one here you need to freaking defend it for. I don't see a strong female character like I do with anyone else in RPGs. I see an incompetent damsel that must always have her goddamn hand held. There's a difference between needing support of friends like in, say, Persona, or needing help constantly because you are unable to get out of the situation, like Callista. In fact, it actually harms Zale's development because he always has to friggin' rescue her, or at least feels he needs to. And all this is done at the cost of his freaking friends' development. That is a horrible way to focus on companionship. But it's not like I never got that these guys weren't friends. Yet because so much is focused on Zale sacrificing the stuff without even considering his friends beforehand, it ruins the character and theme for me with Zale. 
And now, for the worst part of the story. The worst part of this game. Yeah, the romance isn't the worst part. Would you like to know what is? Jaral. Jaral is one of the worst additions to this romance and the story in general. He is literally that snobby coward in every romantic comedy that seeks power or to dominate his girlfriend and other crap like that. There is nothing else to his character, yet he constantly gets in Zale's way, getting him in trouble at every turn, while Zale basically does nothing about it, even when poisoned and then miraculously cured because... game mechanic bullcrap. He never once develops at all. Hell, one of the villains earlier gets more development than he does, helping Zale's group in the end, and his development into a good guy was off-screen! Jeral is only out for himself a coward and an overall selfish brat with nothing else to him. And people complain about Luke von Fabre, at least that character develops. At least he felt something when killing someone and screwing things up royally in his own game. And then after gaining power because, well, even the Grack King knew he was just a tool. And after becoming insane, he dies, trying to earn some sympathy from the player with his last lines while failing. I say failing because the most we can ever get is that his mother was too demanding. Which sorry, but you're not getting empathy points from me since he kept doing villainous acts constantly and with no empathy for others. And overall, very little screen time that wasn't him being a royal douchebag. Again, they had an opportunity to do more with him, just like with any other character, but chose not to. And it's sad I know more about Jarrell's character than most of the damn cast in the friggin' game. It does more harm than good for me, and further paints Zale and Callista as complete friggin' idiots. But you know, all things considered, I'm glad they wasted my time with Jarrell. He only, what, ate up a few hours out of the 20 hours this game is actually worth or something? They just seem to breeze on by. You know, I'm glad that they wasted my time with a character that has absolutely no significant impact on the stupid freaking plot and actually makes the characters worse. No, I'm glad. I'm glad. Don't believe me? You don't believe me? Look at my face! Look at my face! I'm glad, glad, this is the face of someone who is glad! So, you hate this game? <laughs> yes, clean up the freaking evidence! Why would you not- Oh, crap. Um, uh, I'll call you back. <laughs> um, <laughs> hello and welcome back to The Smartest Moron with a completely unrelated call for a completely unrelated incident. <laughs> um, just a word of warning, um, the Nerdy Novices videos, they, um, they may not update for a while. <laughs> um, he's perfectly fine. Uh, come on, buddy, just show up on camera. You see, the thing about that is... That being said though, there is one more thing I felt was a bit more subtle and actually fit the companion theme well. Dagrin. While another case of telling is opposed to showing, big surprise there, he really did manipulate the characters well enough, even when he was in some pretty crappy positions. Ultimately, he is the traitor, but it's hard for me to find some holes in his logic. Well, okay, the whole knight thing is confusing when Zale probably should have known about the dirty crap knights do too, or the fact that every citizen is an asshole like in one past scene. Still, if the game had played up this strength, showing the story of these two and their goals conflicting and all that, this probably would have been pretty damn good. Dagrin's motivation for revenge is sound and he serves as a good dark half for Zale. Both of them were the same in terms of origins, losing their family and village. Zale lost it to bandits and wanted enough power to do good and make sure he never lost anyone again. Dagrin lost it to knights, people who were supposed to be good and honorable, and it ended up setting him on the path of revenge. Their line of thinking is different at times, as can their attitude, yet they remain good friends. It's a shame I didn't get to know more about Dagrin, granted it was pretty obvious toward the end he'd be some kind of backstabber due to his absence. Nonetheless, a second time playing this game, he is one of the better parts. And while he did use the group, feelings of course couldn't be erased so easily. They were still companions after all this time, and the moment was very sudden, unlike other games which have the plot keep going and turn those feelings into something much darker. Dagrin was their leader, a friend, and he returns those feelings in his dying breath, finally showing that regret. It was just the moment this game needed, showing characters with intentions and personality beyond greed and evil. Huh, ending on something positive. I... I honestly didn't expect that, and... It feels good. It feels great. Unfortunately, that's the last of it because I completely freaking screwed up.
yeah, there were supposed to be more things about Xan Callista as well as Therius, but I missed out on that by complete accident. By the time I figured it out, I gave the game back to Gamefly. I even failed to help this guy solve his monster problem. Well, I'm sure these people can handle... Oh, right. Well, hey, at least I don't have to play the sequel if that somehow ever comes out now. So overall, how does this game hold up? Well, it's still honestly crap even with some of the positives I listed. And it's a damn shame too because I want to enjoy this game. The last story has a very predictable story routine for a long time, and any twists and turns aside from maybe one are any decent. It focuses so much time on Zale, which wouldn't be so bad, but he isn't interesting, and his romance just serves to drag down the game even more. Combine this with gameplay with some of the worst swordplay I've ever seen, with a crappy camera, and strategy nearly all but gone save for some boss fights, you get a horrifying mess of a game that probably could have worked better with some changes here and there. But sadly, I can't stand playing this, I can't stand the hero and his love interest, and I never want to touch this game ever again. There are far better RPGs out there that have more replayability than this garbage. I'm the smartest moron, and you know what, screw it. I need my demonic fix, so next time, I'm gonna review Shadow Hearts Covenant. And it'll take over a year. Oh my god, I suck at this. Don't look at me!